Hi, I'm Anne Marie from Brambleberry.com. Thanks so much for joining me on today's episode of Ask Anne Marie. Today is all about melt and pour soap. And so we asked you on Instagram, on the Brambleberry Instagram. P.S. Are you following us? If not, please give us a follow. It's at Brambleberry on Instagram. So we asked you on the Brambleberry Instagram page, what questions do you have for me about melt and pour soap? And so we took some of the questions. Uh, a lot of you had the same questions. So we took some of the questions and I'm going to answer them for you right here and right now. So if you're a beginner at melt and pour soap, you're bound to learn something new. And if you've been doing this for a while, I really hope you learned something new and feel free to share your tips and tricks below as well. So the first question that came in was about what sort of basic ingredients you need for melt and pour soap. So obviously, you, you, yes, you do need the melt and pour soap, but what else do you need besides that? Melt and pour soap is a pre-made block of soap base that has added ingredients like glycerin added to it to make it remelt down easily in the microwave. So some of the extra ingredients you are going to want to use are colors. I personally really like the Brambleberry color blocks because they are pre-mixed in a melt and pour base already. So all you need to do is chop off just a little bit and then add it to your melted melt and pour soap to get any color you want and what you see is what you get. So they're great for beginners. Another thing you need is of course, skin safe fragrance oil. And fragrances, you're like, well, what does skin safe mean? Uh, so you wanna make sure that you're not using any candle or potpourri fragrances. And of course, all the fragrances at brambleberry.com have been tested for soap and bath and body products and are totally safe to use in your melt and pour soap and all your other bath and body products. Another thing you're gonna to want to use probably is you could you always get away with a knife, but I really like these crinkle cutters for cutting the soap, um, either as a decorative final product for cutting soap, but also when you melt this down in the microwave, you do need to cut it into small like one inch cubes to help with the ease of melting. Finally, of course, you're gonna want a mold. I love the Brambleberry silicone molds, although we do carry a lot of different kinds of molds. Any sort of mold you use, the basic rule of thumb is it has to have give. And so you're not gonna wanna use like say a, uh, well, glass container, right? Because you're not gonna be able to pull it out and pop your soap out. Um, metal would be really difficult as well, but a lot of people use Tupperware and that kind of stuff. And especially when you're starting out, you're almost always on a budget. So yes, Tupperware totally works for that as well. Some nice to have things. Well, a thermometer is really nice to have. And this really helps for swirling and for layering to just really be able to gauge your temperature and know where you're at in the soap making process. Other things that are really helpful to have are heat safe containers that you can just use just only for soap. And of course, a spray bottle with rubbing alcohol is very important for melt and pour soap making because when you pour your melt and pour soap into your molds, a lot of times you'll get bubbles and those bubbles dissipate with one quick spray of the rubbing alcohol. The next question is, can I add extra oils to my base? So melt and pour base is perfectly balanced as is. It's going to rinse away cleanly, have great lather and not leave your skin feeling tight and dry. But if you want to add a little bit of conditioning or a little bit of skin loving oils to your soap base, of course you can. However, very much of it is going to weigh down the lather. Literally the oil will sit on top of the bubbles and pop the bubbles. So you'll end up with more of a conditioning bar. So that's something to keep in mind when you're balancing usage rates. I don't like to use more than one teaspoon of additional oil per pound of melt and pour soap. If you do much more than that, you'll really notice your bar's gonna get just a little bit soft. It could get a little unbalanced and you might end up with a little bit of extra soap sweat as well. So I've got about a pound of soap here and I'm gonna add just a little bit of lemon extract, which you're like, well, lemon extract isn't an oil. Brambleberry is lemon extracts. And in fact, all of our extracts are oil soluble, meaning they're in fractionated coconut oil. And then I'm gonna add just a little bit of avocado oil to this Brambleberry white melt and pour base. And you can see it's really easy. You just measure out the amount of oil you're gonna use, you drop it into your melted soap base and you stir. You wanna make sure that it's fully incorporated in. And if you're trying to add something that's solid at room temperature, like say a mango butter, a cocoa butter, a shea butter, sometimes you can let the heat of the melted soap melt those butters. But with harder oils, like your cocoa butter um, or beeswax, say you wanted to do beeswax, you're gonna need to pre-melt that in the microwave or on a, a double boiler, just to make sure that it actually gets into the soap and doesn't just sit there as a chunk. So now that this is fully stirred in, you just pour into your molds, you let this harden like usual, and you are all done. One of the questions we had the most on the Instagram account was how do you swirl melt and pour soap? So a couple things. One, melt and pour swirls, they're just not gonna look like cold process swirls. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for this, primarily because melt and pour soap gives you a very finite, a small window of time that you can really swirl with it. And so these soaps we just made this week, and you'll notice they're gorgeous. They are swirled 
just delicately, it's wispy. They really pack kind of just a visual punch and they don't look like cold processed soap swirls. So some tips though, it's all about the temperature. Every single brand of melt and pour soap has a different temperature at which it can be swirled at. The, um, my favorite ones from Brambleberry are more of a, you swirl kind of around 130, 140-ish. Other brands, they're gonna have different temperatures. So figure out what the ideal swirling temperature is for the brand of soap that you are using. Um, you want the, both the temperatures to be really similar to each other. So this is where a temp gun comes in really handy. This one is right at 137, 138. This one's just a little bit warmer because I did just re-microwave it. And, but what I wanna show you is when you're swirling, so one of the things you wanna do is you can kind of just pour together and you can literally pour together and see the swirls kind of happening. When the soap is hotter, the swirls end up looking more Ah, uh, well together, they're finer, they're wispier, they're a little less defined. When the soap is cooler, meaning it's, it's going to pour and then literally just stay there, you can get much bigger, much more dramatic swirls. But with melt and pour soap, that process is kind of a constant melt, pour, let it sit, remelt, pour, let it sit. You have to use a lot of patience when you're doing swirling with melt and pour soap, but it's absolutely possible to get gorgeous swirls with melt and pour soap. Um, it just takes a little bit of patience, little bit of kind of focusing on your temperatures and also being prepared to kind of go back and forth between different colors. So that way it's not just a pour all one together like you can with melt, uh, cold process soap. Another tip is to use really contrasting colors. So if you are using two colors that are kind of really similar to each other, you're just not gonna get a great looking swirl because you're not gonna be able to see it. It's not gonna be well defined enough. So using white, uh, white melt and pour soap with a clear melt and pour soap is one really great way to get those contrasts. Um, another really great way is to use like a dark color and a light color, just like we did in here. I also love to do what, like gold mica veins in these. So this would look really fun with like a gold mica vein in there as well. So those are some tips and tricks for getting swirls, but really it's just all about patience, all about temperature control, and making sure you give yourself enough time to work with it, pick contrasting colors, and you can see I'm building up my layers of swirls right here. This is gonna be a really great looking bar of soap when it's all done. Okay, as it's getting cooler, you're gonna notice that this isn't gonna swirl together quite as much. Do you see how clumpy that is? So this white is just kind of staying right where it is. So if I really wanna get swirls now, I have to make that green kind of break through. So this is all about temperature control. This is all about really watching and kind of also knowing your soap base. So that goes back to the whole like, what temperature does your soap base swirl at? What's ideal for it? So I'm just gonna set this to the side and we'll see what this looks like after it's all set up. I can't wait. One final tip for swirling is when you want to really get this effect, you have to pour in a mold that you can cut down the sides. That's really where the swirl magic happens. So on like these four sides here, it's not gonna be all that swirly looking. It's the insides that look the most swirly. So pouring in a loaf mold or something kind of long and thin or in one of these horizontal molds is going to give you the best melt and pour swirls. So another question that came in was, hey, what do I do about soap sweating? Well, so first of all, what is soap sweat? Melt and pour soap has added glycerin added to it. Glycerin is a humectant, meaning it draws moisture to the skin, or in this case, the soap. So if you're in a particularly humid environment, it will, the soap itself will draw moisture to itself, causing little tiny beads of sweat to actually just kind of bead up like little tiny raindrops, dew drops, on your bar of soap. It's totally fine, it doesn't hurt the soap, but it's not particularly appealing. So what can you do to solve that? couple different things. One, you can, uh, one, use a low sweat melt and pour soap from brambleberry.com. We call it light cold process because it has less glycerin in it. Two, when your soap gets out, if you are constantly having soap sweat problems, run it, run a fan over it for like two to three hours. That really helps to create a much more dry kind of top outside crust. So that way the soap doesn't get soap sweat. Three, if you're doing additives, additives can really throw off kind of the chemistry of the soap. Pull out those additives, see if that solves your soap sweat problems. Um, three, another thing you can also do is wrap your soap right away. And so there's a couple different ways you can wrap your soap. One, you can use these awesome shrink wrap bands from Brambleberry where they come flat 
you just kind of pull them up, slip your little soap inside of them, and then you shrink wrap them or you heat seal them down. Now you can get like a shrink wrap tunnel. I just use a regular, uh, honestly, this is like a paint heat gun from like Home Depot or something. I like these shrink wrap bands because they also have just a little, this you can't see it, but it's perforated. So you can just pull it down to open it up. So another way of wrapping your soap to help prevent glycerin dew is just by using just saran wrap or cling wrap. So how that works is very similar to using the heat seal sleeves. Take your soap and you put it down and then you wrap it. And you guys, we have an entire episode on soap wrapping. So it's one of our earlier episodes. So you can always go back and refer to that because I really talk about how to do this. So you pull it really tight, then you pull this over and then you don't want a big tail. If you have a big tail, you end up kind of with a weird lump and you're gonna put a label on it. So it's, that's not gonna matter so much, but you don't want the lump to be affecting your, you don't want it to be the lump to affect how your label looks. So here, and then you turn on your heat gun. And again, it's gotta be on low. If you do it on high, you can burn a hole in the, the saran wrap or you could also melt the soap. So there's that. And you do a really quick kind of heat, press down, quick heat press down and now you turn this over and you kind of just give it a quick thing on one side, the other side, the other side, the other side and over the top. And this, if you end up doing much more than that, you really run the risk of kind of creating a hole in this saran wrap because the saran wrap is significantly more uh, kind of fragile than the shrink wrap. And so benefits to this, one, you can get it anywhere, right? You don't have to have anything fancy, but it's not nearly as durable as your actual shrink wrap. So both of them work great, and those are two really great ways to preserve your soap and help to prevent soap sweat. So speaking of sweating, someone asked a question about, can you put melt and pour soap inside cold process soap? Short answer is absolutely. If you look back at old uh, in the studio project archives or at the old Soap Queen blog archives, you will see I have done all manner of melt and pour soap and cold process soap, including swirling cold process and melt and pour soap together. Some secrets and tips and tricks though, because melt and pour soap evaporates at a different um, rate than cold process soap. Cold process soap and melt and pour soap both have water in them and they both lose their water as they age. But what happens when this happens is the two will delaminate from each other, meaning they will pull apart as the melt and pour soap loses water at a different rate than the cold process soap. Simple fix for that, use the light cold process melt and pour soap from brambleberry.com. The second reason you wanna use the light cold process soap from brambleberry.com for your embeds in all of your cold process soap projects is that sweating question we just talked about, remember? Melt and pour soap has glycerin in it. It's a humectant, draws moisture to the soap. So when it's sitting inside a moist environment, your cold process soap that is how much percent water, right? It's 30% water. It's going to naturally want to sweat. And so the light cold process soap, melt and pour soap from Brambleberry has less naturally occurring glycerin and less added glycerin to it. So that will help it from keep from sweating. Now, if you don't have any regular kind of cold process or light cold process melt and pour soap, could you use a regular melt and pour soap? You absolutely can. I would make the embeds a solid week or two ahead of time, run them under a fan, really let them dry out and get hard before using them as an embed in your cold process soap. So yes, you can put cold process and melt and pour together. You can do an embed made out of melt and pour soap in your cold process soap with those tips. So this next question is about, well, honestly, it's about temperatures. If your melt and pour soap is hardening up before you can pour it into your mold, it probably means your temperatures are off. So either one, you are not working fast enough. Uh, you really don't have a lot of time, one to three minutes after your soap is melted in order to do your designs, add your colors, add your fragrance. Two, you might have overheated your soap, which then caused a lot of that moisture to evaporate off, which causes the entire thing to get too hard too fast. So really watch your temperatures when you are melting your soap, you never want it to boil. If it boils, it can get yellow, it can smell bad, and it can harden too quickly. Uh, three, I don't know what brand of soap base you're using. I really like these brands of soap bases, obviously, because they do give you a lot longer of a time to work with them. So make sure when you're making your melt and pour soap, you can see that skin forming. You can see it when it starts to get kind of gloppy. Some of that's a little bit of experience. So just work a little bit faster consider maybe watching your temperatures, make sure your temperatures are great. And if you haven't tried the Brambleberry soap bases, start with the Brambleberry Clear, Brambleberry White. Uh, these are really good beginner bases to start with. 
And then the final question is a really interesting one. It's I just kind of started making mountain pour soap and there's this weird smell to it. And what's going on with that? So I don't know what brand of melt and pour you're using, but there are some melt and pours that are basically uh, sodium lauryl sulfates or synthetic detergents mixed with hardeners. And I notice the smells on those too. Like I totally can smell a weird, odd, well, synthetic detergent smell on them. So I don't know which one you're using, but that's one thing to think about is, is your soap base using like real oils? Like the soap base has real oils in it, or is it using synthetic detergents? It could just be as easy as switching out the base. Two, let's talk temperatures. Are you accidentally boiling your soap in the microwave when you're melting it? That also makes a very bad smelling bar of soap. Uh, so I would really be thinking about those two things. And then third, I'd be looking at how much fragrance you're adding. Are you adding enough? I mean, soap on its own smells well, soapy. And then you wanna make sure you're adding enough fragrance, the good usage rate to kind of overscent any sort of soapy smell that's naturally there anyways. You guys, thanks so much for watching this episode of Ask Anne Marie. I hope these tips and tricks help. We have lots of melt and pour recipes and projects at the In the Studio tab at brambleberry.com. Oh my goodness, I can't wait to see what you make and create. And when you do make it and you put it on social media, will you do me a favor and hashtag it Bramble on so we can all see what you're doing with our projects and our ideas and our ingredients, but also you can inspire an entire community of makers. And if you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so you're notified every single time we come out with a new video. Until next time, happy soaping.